and welcome to the Wormhole Podcast. Joining me today is the author of the stunning but dark short story collection, Jerusalem Ablaze, and the recent brilliant psychological thriller, The Death of Baseball. Hello, Orlando Ortega Medina. Hi, Charlie. How are you? I'm good. Yeah, you? Yeah, very well, thanks. Excited about this. It's going to be good. Yes. So, so you are an immigration lawyer, but you studied English literature at degree level. Can you tell us more about your background to becoming a writer? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, well, I've been writing uh, as long as I can remember, you know, obviously children's level stuff uh, when I was quite young. But uh, first started on my, remember my very first formal short story that I wrote, which was when I was uh, in high school, which would be the equivalent of secondary here. And uh, from there, I um, always had uh, ambitions of, of being a professional writer. And uh, so my first step towards that was uh, an Eng- English literature major with a creative writing concentration at university, mm. um, which I, I loved. And, uh, you know, as I was nearing the end of my um, university uh, studies, I you know, had to consider what was I going to do, uh, whether I was going to go into academia and con- continue to write on the side or journalism or what have you. So I spoke to a, a lot of people who are actual working writers um, with ambitions to be novelists, for example. And they said to me, I'm so tired by the end of the day that uh, I just, you know, I don't have time to actually do any creative writing. So uh, I'd recommend that you study something else other than or than, or go into a different profession other than writing. So I thought long and hard about that, and I thought, well, law is you know something that might be compatible. There's a lot of sort of creativity that goes into that, and there is some writing, legal writing, and all. But it wouldn't, it, it would perhaps be something that could give me enough money on a part-time basis where I could be writing at the other half of the time. Um, it didn't quite work out that way for me because law is not something that you can do part-time. It's really something at the end of the day you have to do full-time. Mm. So uh, then I just continued to do writing on my very spare time that I had as a lawyer. And it's only until, say, the last five years that I've actually been able to, to come back to it and in earnest. And, uh, and that's where I'm at now. Uh, that's really interesting, because I've obviously hearing that you're a lawyer, I thought, gosh, you know, you must have to fit your writing in, in, in short periods. But hearing that uh, writing came first is, yeah, that's, that's very interesting to hear. Um, So I wouldn't usually ask this question, but uh, with your often particularly dark stories combined with your dedication to character development uh, in Jerusalem Ablaze, I wanted to know, where do you get your ideas? Uh, I get them from dreams, actually. Uh, I sleep with a notebook next to my head. And uh, so it's I think there's a lot of of that sort of dark material somehow buried inside of me. Don't know how it got there, but it helps quite a lot to work it out on paper. And I find that the best time to do that is as I'm coming out of, uh, of sleep, I'm, I'm able to perhaps connect to a subconscious part of myself while I'm still in the process of waking up. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's usually when I do my, my, my writing, my co- composition initially, first draft will be as uh, just as I've woken up, I usually will step over to my writing desk and I'll write for two hours um, and then put it aside and not really revisit it until I'm at a stage where I can look at it with fresh eyes and edit it uh, with uh, an editor's mind. Hmm. Um, so when Jerusalem Ablaze was published, there was an article that you had uh, you were interviewed in, in which you spoke about wanting to entertain readers rather than leave them with messages from your stories. I was wondering if you could as- expand on this, because short stories often do have messages, and I think it's an interesting diversion from that. Yeah, I've always been of the opinion that uh, a storyteller's job is to tell a story um, rather than to... Uh, rather than to be some sort of a, um, how can I put it, like a moralist. I mean, I'm not, a, I, I don't consider myself to be an Aesop who I'm going to tell something that at the end there's going to be a lesson to be learned from it. I just think that there's so many stories out there. We all, our lives are stories. And, you know, at the end of the day, is there a lesson to be learned 
from the lives that we live. I, I, I don't know that there necessarily is. So, you know, I may sit down with somebody who will tell me about something that happened in their life or in their day or, you know, something that's happening in their family's life. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's just a story. It's not really, there's not really much to be taken away from it other than either to be horrified or entertained or maybe to give the person some advice. But I, I think that this, the artificiality of trying to send a message through your writing is something that I've never really plugged into. Hmm. Now, I found it very interesting because uh, I love short stories and I love the way that there are often messages to them, but it's it kind of takes a lot of your mental energy to kind of restart each time and go back to square one. So that is something I really liked about your your collection, that you can just read it through and really enjoy it while you're reading it. Mm. That's, yeah, something I loved about it. So your work in general is very diverse, uh, particularly particularly in culture and location. You've got a lot set in Israel that you can see your background in. Uh, how much of this is our... How much of these stories are related to your experiences? The stories grow out of experiences that I've had, um, not necessarily the stories themselves, but a lot of the settings and uh, some of the characters that I write about are modeled on you know, maybe people or types that I've met. And so I might take uh, an initial story idea and then push it to its limit. Um, mm. So, but I wouldn't say that there's anything particularly autobiographical or strongly biographical about what I write, but I, I do think that it grows out of my own personal experiences. And every um, setting that I have in, for example, the short stories, I've, I've been in and I've lived in those settings that I write about. So I've traveled quite a lot. Uh, and every time I travel, I, I take notes uh, in, a, in a sketchbook, um, if you will. And then I use that sketchbook to refer back when I'm, when I'm writing a story in a particular setting or a country or a city. Mm. Talking of where you've been and where you've lived, perhaps it's because I'm interested in the culture myself. But there seems to me a lot of content in both your collection and uh, The Death of Baseball about Japanese people and their culture. So is that in particular uh, a place that you have a particular interest in? Interest in? Yeah, when, uh, when I was about 14, 15 years old, I lived for about a two year period uh, with a family that uh, was for all intents and purposes, a Japanese family that happened to be have relocated to the United States mm -hmm. uh, for a period of time for the education of their children. So, and I was best friends with uh, with one of the the kids who was around my age, and uh, so learned quite a lot about Japanese culture and Japanese food, and and developed a, a strong interest in 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 Japan. And then uh, in university, along with my English major, which was my main course, I also did a minor, is what we call it in the states, uh, in uh, Japanese studies. I read a lot of Japanese literature and translation. Uh, and mm. then finally, eventually went to Japan. And that's where a lot of these ideas and stories came from. I see. Yes. that um, Hearing that, yes, the death of baseball particularly, you can certainly, now that you've said that, and I can put it together and, and see where it all works. Yes. Uh, shall we have a reading from Jerusalem and Blades? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, I'll read something that's actually said in Japan. Uh, since we're talking about it. It's called Eyesore in the Ginza. It's a, a short, short story. Today was the first time I ever saw a beggar. It was a pretty disgusting sight, too. He was lying in the little alleyway between our dentist's office and the liquor store. I think it was an American, but I'm not really sure. He sure wasn't Japanese. What kind of bothered me was that here was this dirty hakujin, sprawled in our nice, clean Ginza alley, making a real eyesore of himself. He was dressed all in rags like you'd expect, except for his shoes. Those really stood out. A pair of black leather Louis Vuitton high-top trainers, the kind I like, and they looked brand new. Now I know what you're probably thinking. What, you might ask, 
would a stinking beggar be doing smack in the middle of the Ginza anyway? A thorn on the rose of our neighborhood. Well, that's exactly what I asked myself. As I stood there thinking this over, he suddenly opened his eyes. I was startled for a moment. He was more startled. In a flip flash, I slugged him over the head with my book bag. He lunged forward and I smacked him again. This time his head hit the brick wall behind him and he went out like a video game in tilt. I quickly stooped down and untied the shoes. My hands worked furiously, pulling here and tugging there. A couple of times, I gagged on the tramp stench. He reeked of sake and garlic. Just as I yanked the shoes off the louse, a gurgly sound came out of his throat. I thought he was about to reboot, so I beamed him again. His face went splat into the gutter. I had the shoes in my book bag so fast, I could have beat the bullet train in a race. And just in time, too, I could hear my mom yelling out my name. She was done with her dentist appointment. I think she got fitted with some new dentures or something. She'd be pretty sore at me since I hadn't waited in the lounge like I was supposed to. I didn't care. I had a new pair of shoes. Yeah, it's still love that one. I think it's my favorite of the entire collection, actually. That one and the shovelist, uh-huh. um, which has so much character development. And yeah, that's that's why I mentioned character de- development earlier, particularly because you have these characters and I think it's across eight pages and it's like you've been writing them and the reader's been reading them for ages. Mm. And I just love that. Yeah. Uh, we be- better move on to your book. Um, your recent release, The Death of Baseball, which is a book about a boy in the 1970s who's uh, Clyde, who believes he's the reincarnation of Marilyn Monroe. It's also about another boy, Raphael, who's struggling with his family's putting him on a pedestal while he's a kleptomaniac and devoted Jew. The book begins with a one-page prologue, first-person narrative by Marilyn Monroe on the day she dies, where her soul goes to a newborn baby. So it's a fascinating concept. Why Marilyn Monroe? Oh my, so this book this book was in development for quite a long time and this idea of uh, a Japanese boy who believed he was Marilyn Monroe was sort of the first image that, that came to me when I was, I don't know, when, when the story was, I suppose, floating in the ether looking for an author. Mm. Um, and so it was the initial, was, it was the imagery about somebody who was having an issue with their identity. Um, I myself, when I was quite young, I had quite a lot of identity issues because of my background. And I connected very much with uh, Elton John at the time. So I had this whole idea that, you know, I wished I was Elton John. And and, and I related to this idea of seeking identity, at least for a temporary period, in in celebrity. So I, Mm -hmm. I know there are a lot of people out there who, you know, it may be an issue of identity or what have you, but they come to admire a particularly a particular celebrity quite a lot and they may even start to emulate them and to dress like them so anyway when thinking about this Japanese American character who was um, who was having trouble with his identity and looking for someone to connect with uh, I, I became fascinated with the idea of you know what it would look like if you know I, I, I played around with different uh, different celebrities and I thought, okay, a Japanese American person who perhaps cross dresses like Marilyn Monroe would be a fascinating visual image. Mm. So that's what I started with. Actually, was just the image of a Japanese guy who is uh, relates very much to Marilyn Monroe. And then I kind of had to build up the, the story as to why does he relate to Marilyn Monroe? What is it about her that he? Uh, that he admires, what is it, what is the reason that her in particular, so I started playing with the idea of when he was born, when she died, and so the whole story grew out of that one idea, which was somebody who was um, relating to Marilyn Monroe as a substitute for their own identity issues. So the reincarnation came second then? Yes. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh- if I can ask, who were the other celebrities that you were thinking about? Oh, it's it's a long time ago now, so I can't. <laughs> it's it's like at this point, Clyde has always been Marilyn, um, and mm-hmm. Marilyn has always been Clyde. Um, so I I don't really remember to be honest. If that's a good answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
so I wanted to ask about the title, the uh, the death of baseball. I know before I read the summary of of the book, uh, and I saw the cover image first, and the word baseball jumped out at me and got me thinking of Marilyn and Joe DiMaggio, mm-hmm. uh, her second her second husband, who after she remarried and later died, uh, sent flowers to her gravesite. I think it was every year. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. So there's a potential reference to DiMaggio in the book, but mm. it's kind of vague and the content is more about Clyde and his uh, journey with baseball. So I was just wondering if you can expand on this and your choices in regards to baseball. Yeah, so, um, well, I guess here I'm going to move a little bit into biography, which is my father was and is uh, a big baseball fan. Mm. And uh, I, I was not. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And uh, being my father's first child, he really wanted to be able to have something to connect with me uh, with. And he and so he decided that that was going to be baseball. And he did everything he could do to get me to play baseball and uh, with him and on teams and what have you. And I absolutely hated it. And it got to the point where I, I felt so... Um, compelled by him to play baseball that that it almost for a child uh, at the age of uh, whatever I was nine or ten years old you know I came to feel almost like I I hated him for trying to force me to play baseball so it uh, so I I kind of transferred that idea over to Clyde's story uh, that his father always also was a baseball aficionado but in Clyde's case as opposed to in my case Clyde actually became a champion baseball player And uh, so he was quite successful at it. And even that was not enough to please Clyde's father. So Mm. when he finally closes the door on his childhood and and moves into this idea that um, he's he's the reincarnation of Marilyn Monroe and he's going to be protecting her her soul inside of his body, um, then I thought to myself, well, that, that basically he puts baseball to rest. In fact, baseball dies with his childhood. So... The death of baseball is a symbol for the death of Clyde's childhood, which, you know, as, as you've read the story, you understand why he would want his child to die, his mm. childhood to die. So that's um, where I got the idea for the title of the book. Now, interestingly enough, the original title, because the working title for the book was Marilyn and Jimmy. And mm. I, I had a few discussions with, with friends about potential titles and all. And uh, the death of baseball was something that I, I floated and, and immediately um, my trusted friends and readers thought that that was a very uh, a, a good choice. One, because of the symbolism and also mm-hmm. because, the, especially in the American context, baseball is such a beloved sport, I, I suppose, like football here, that to say to have a book titled The Death of Baseball was going to be something quite provocative and um would get people to sit up and pay attention to it as if, you know, the equivalent of if somebody wrote a book called the death of football here, that mm. probably would, would be quite provocative here as well. So that's the story about the title. Yeah. You, you say uh, you were going to call it, uh, include Jimmy in the title. There is a part in the book. Um, I don't want to spoil too much. So I'll just say that there's a part in the book where you have a Jimmy. And uh, I did wonder where that comes into the, the whole idea of, Joe and Marilyn. Um, is it okay to talk about that at all? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, basically, I was just wondering: um, is is that DiMaggio in a in a, uh, a different form? Uh, no, I, 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 what I, yeah, no, I, we don't want to do any spoilers here. But the third section of the <laughs> book is 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 called Marilyn and Jimmy, so the title actually made yeah. it into the book, and um, it's the it's Clyde Clyde stroke Marilyn projecting uh her image of James Dean onto the secondary character of the book which is Ralph Mm -hmm. so it's kind of her wish in a way to have another to have a a a second reincarnated person along with her Mm. okay so uh looking at the abuse of the book Clyde's father is physically and emotionally abusive uh, I know at your book launch, you said that this wasn't anything from experience. And I wondered uh, what what you were using it for in terms of bringing it into the book. What I was using it for? You mean mm. the, re- the reason why Clyde's father was abusive? Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I, 
I needed to have a, a strong enough motivation in Clyde's um, background to to drive him to the to look for that uh, solace in the belief that he was uh, the reincarnation of Mar Marilyn Monroe. So mm. the father, in addition to being abusive, uh, also has the also has the belief, and he he tries to share this with the family that Clyde is carrying some kind of a, a re, uh, an evil spirit or a reincarnated spirit of a, of a prior sibling of, uh, of a sibling of Clyde who died before Clyde was born. Mm. So all of these threads kind of come together uh, to, um, to cause Clyde to turn inward uh, as a uh, survival mechanism and to find strength inside of himself and also the, an explanation for why he had a spirit inside of his body that you know isn't necessarily the evil spirit that his father says it is. So I, th I think it was is necessary to push Clyde into that um, semi delusional mode that he he ends up in for a period of time. Mm, yeah, I, I found it very powerful I and mean, it's very difficult to read. And at the same time, it's you you have to read it, <clears> and you're you're obviously rooting for Clyde. So. Um, you know, because it, it was so powerful, I would like to stay on the subject um, for a moment and just, yeah. uh, I found your use of Clyde's cat, the Neko, which is Japanese for cat, uh, to be incredibly moving. Um, it was illustrative of the emotional impact of the abuse. And in the text, uh, following Clyde's mother's advice that he try and forget everything, you block the word for cat out wherever it would otherwise appear. And maybe it's because, you know, I've, I've recently had a cat, I had a cat most of my childhood but I found that just so powerful uh, and I wondered what your thoughts were um, when you did this um, you mean in terms of the blocking blocking it out I yes or... yeah it's an interesting um, choice um, well <laughs> I, uh, I had I had personal experience with this uh, method with dealing with things uh, in somebody in my family was uh, had, I mean, it was exactly the way that Clyde's mother is when it comes to this, which is, you know, there's something bad, uh, if there's something bad that's happening, just push mm -hmm. it out of your mind, put it in a box and bury it there. So I, I, it was something that always stayed with me from, from childhood that uh, there were people who used this method um, it's, you know, obviously it doesn't get rid of it. It just puts it deep inside of you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so, uh, that's what, and, and, um, ironically, or, or it, by design, there is actual, an actual box that, that makes an appearance later on in the, in the story that is almost like the box comes out into reality. It's no longer in his mind. It actually comes out. And mm -hmm. then I, I don't know if you remember, remember that. Bit, but uh, yes, yeah. yeah. So there is kind of a relation between uh, the the death of the cat, the burying it in a box in his mind, and then the the box that shows up later. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Just yeah. That. Yeah. I can't say any more on that. Okay. Um. The the book is a, so going back. The book is about reincarnation. And but there are points when, as a reader, you might wonder if it's actually about being transgender. I found, and I wondered if you were worried about such misunderstandings happening. Well, they have happened, <laughs> mm. actually. <laughs> uh, and but and it, I, I try not to. Peep, as I'm working, and uh, and things are developing on paper, uh, almost almost beyond my control uh, because I, I don't plot things out in great detail. So I, I just go with the flow. And as things come out, I try not to um, hold myself back from writing whatever it is that I'm writing because of the fear that how somebody's going to react to it. Um, mm. That said, when I got to the end of the story and read it through uh, in first draft and all, it did come to my mind and other people raised it that it, it could present an issue for some people. Um, interestingly, uh, the people who uh, read the, the book and interpret Clyde as being transgender uh, have an issue with the book. Um, mm. Other people who understand that this is, yeah, there, there are aspects of that here, but really this is about 
a, uh, a young man who, for psychological reasons, comes to believe that he is the reincarnation of Marilyn Monroe, and everything grows out of that belief um, rather than a belief that he is a woman and he needs to change his body to look like a woman. So um, my, not to put too much of my own interpretation onto it, but my view on it is that Clyde is not transgender. Um, Clyde is somebody who could be seen to be transgender uh, from the outside, but he actually is not. He's actually somebody who genuinely believes that he is the reincarnation of Marilyn Monroe, who is a female, and therefore he exteriorizes that. Um, mm. And maybe he is and maybe he's not. I, I don't think that that's something that I think that is ruled out um, in the book that he is not the reincarnation of Marilyn Monroe. Mm. Yeah, I, I always thought when, when I was reading it, obviously, well, more when I get to the end of it and see everything that's going on. And I thought if you ask, if you ask Clyde, are you a woman? He's going to say, I'm Marilyn Monroe. Correct. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yes, there's def definitely bits. And uh, again, I don't want to spoil things, but there's times when you think, oh, OK, you know, what's what's happening? But yes, I just thought I would ask that one. Uh, bringing in the second main character, because we haven't really talked about it much yet, Raphael. He's got problems uh, similarly to Clyde, but in a way they're also very different. So I was wondering if you could tell us about Raphael, Raphael particularly in the context of religion and identity. Okay, so Raphael is, uh, was born in Israel uh, to a family uh, who, at, at his grandparents' level, emigrated to Israel from Syria on, on his father's side. And they're a very religious family, Orthodox, um, very observant, traditional. And uh, they emigrate to him and his, his father and his mother and sister and him. They emigrate to Los Angeles uh, when Raphael is eight years old. And Raphael is a very uh, highly functioning, um, you know, a genius level child, both uh, in terms of the study of, of Talmud, which is, are the, uh, is a religious text in, in Judaism, and um, also his adaptability. Uh, he, he learns languages very quickly. He's a, he's a high functioning athlete and artist. So he's, you can say, a Renaissance child. Um, but... He also suffers from the compulsion to steal, which is a kind of, uh, from a kleptomania, which is a kind of an OCD um, um, psychological problem. Uh, so he has difficulty juggling a few things. One is, you know, being um, devoutly religious, but at the same time having this compulsion that he finds difficult to control. Uh, and he seeks, he seeks help for this problem of kleptomania in his religion, but he doesn't actually find the uh, the cure for it in his religion. So um, that's how we come to meet him at the beginning of his story. And you say you started with Marilyn Monroe and Clyde. Where did when did uh, Raphael come into the story in terms of when you were writing it? So Raphael and so originally the first draft. Let me go back. The first draft of the Death of Baseball, um, there was a character uh, where Raphael stands now, who was not Raphael. It was a completely different character in the first incarnation of the Death of Baseball. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was uh, maybe about 10 years ago. When I when I wrote the first incarnation of the Death of Baseball, right, and so, and so um, I was uh, revisiting the the story and uh, decided that I didn't really like the character that I had there to begin with, uh, whose name was Paul. So I started to think and think and think about that. Who was that character that was going to be opposite uh, Clyde? And uh, it came to me during, um, actually, I, I'm Jewish myself, and uh, I was in the middle of the high holidays. It was Yom Kippur. And all of a sudden, it's like the light went on in my head. And I said, uh, ah, he, the character is going to be Jewish. He's going to be born in Yom Kippur just like today. And, uh, and so I started to really, really develop him, his background, his character. And uh, I plugged into a lot of my own personal experiences when I lived in Israel, uh, when I was about 18 years old. And uh, just 
so I would say that Raphael was literally born on um, Yom Kippur, which is the holiest day of the Jewish calendar, three years ago. And he just came flowing out uh, on paper. Uh, and then I incorporated him and, uh, and Clyde together into one narrative. And that's how that happened. Okay, no, that, that's interesting because um, one thing I noticed, particularly again rereading, is that you, um, well, in Jerusalem and Blaze itself, you've got uh, similar names that show up and sometimes uh, they are stories with the same characters and sometimes they're not. And um, I can't remember the title right now, but there's a story that uh, where a child goes to, um, he goes to Israel with his father. And the father was saying to him, uh, do you love me? And I I wondered at that point if maybe Raphael, Raphael had come from there because there's a slight um, similarity. So, no, that, that's really interesting to hear about. That he's uh, a lot in a, a completely different place, basically. Yeah, uh, and sorry to, sorry to interrupt, but one thing. No, no, uh, okay. it, um, there's a character in The Death of Baseball um, when Raphael is, you know, at 16 years old, this character is 14 years old, they go to the same synagogue, and it's his name is Mark Sadot, and he's the rabbi's mm -hmm. son in Death of Baseball. He is also the main character in the story in Jerusalem Ablaze, which is um, an Israel state of mind, part one and part two. Mm. So he makes, so there are characters that do make appearances in the, in the, the two books and in different stories that are related to each other. I did wonder about Mark. Yes, I was, I was just actually flicking through the Death Baseball earlier, and I saw Mark Sojourner. Ah, so, yes, yeah, that is interesting to know. Uh, shall we have a reading from the Death of Baseball? Okay, sure. So let's see. This is this is a story. This is this section of uh, the Death of Baseball is where we meet Clyde. Uh, now as an adult, um, fully, uh, in, fully connecting with the idea that he is the reincarnation of Marilyn Monroe. And uh, it starts on Wednesday, the 4th of October, 1982. It's a blistering summer afternoon in Hollywood. The boulevard is seething with tourists and derelicts jostling past each other on the jammed pavement amidst the usual glitz and garbage. On the corner of Hollywood and Highland, a sunburnt middle-aged Hispanic woman with Frida Kahlo braids, wearing a white dress and a red poncho, perches on a fire hydrant, selling maps to the stars' homes. She's been sitting on the same fire hydrant, selling the same magazine for the past 25 years and can spot an interested buyer three blocks away. On this particular scorcher of a day, she spies a pair of shapely legs through the crowds, draped in a knee-length red satin skirt, hugged by black fishnet stockings and set in impatiently tapping stiletto heels, waiting at the crosswalk to, tr to traverse Highland. The crowd surges forward after the tail end of a mass of cars inches past the intersection. The woman readies herself to hawk her magazine as the legs move in her direction. The crowd mounts the pavement on the woman's side of the street as the traffic signal changes to green. It parts to reveal the owners of, owner of the legs, a young and curvy creature with shoulder-length platinum blonde hair, styled into elaborate retro waves that frame a heavily powdered, angular face. The blonde creature sashays up to the woman on the fire hydrant and yanks a copy of Maps to the Stars' Homes out of her grasp with its elegantly manicured hands. Flipping to the index, it runs a red lacquered fingernail down an alphabetical list of names and stops at the listing, Marilyn Monroe, Joe DiMaggio, Honeymoon House. Then, flicking a $5 bill at the woman, the creature saunters down the boulevard in the direction of the Chinese theater. Later that night, the creature struggles through a hedgerow surrounding a large estate, careful not to tear the pink satin evening gown it has changed into. Its spike heels catch in the dirt and it stumbles to its knees. Picking itself off the ground, the creature pulls them off and hobbles through a break in the greenery the rest of the way to the, to the house. It tests the doors on the ground floor and finds them all locked. Then it jiggles the windows and finding one in the back of the building that's unlatched, 
pushes it open and climbs into the darkened house. The creature glides through the kitchen and across the foyer, then mounts a circular staircase and ascends to the next floor, where it finds a long hallway. Tiptoeing from door to door, it listens briefly at each one, then stops at the end of the hall outside a door from which emanates a high-pitched humming. Finding the door unlocked, the creature pushes it open slowly. Through the open door, the creature sees a shaggy young man in a tattered nightshirt, passed out in an easy chair in front of a TV set, which is broadcasting the end of programming test pattern. Lunging forward, the creature throws itself at the young man's bare feet and hugs his legs. Joe, wake up, the creature says in a hoarse voice. The young man stirs. I'm back, Joe. I've come back. The young man wakes up and blinks at the creature, then forcefully pushes it away, sending it tumbling backward. What the? The young man rises to his full height. No, Joe. The creature scrambles to its feet and smoothens its evening gown. It's me, Marilyn. I'm back. The creature slinks forward, a pouty smile on its face, its arms thrown open, ready to embrace the young man who takes a step backward and bumps into the chair, his eyes growing wide. Don't you recognize your Marilyn anymore, Joe? It purrs. As the creature reaches the young man with its cherry red lips puckered for a kiss, he pulls back his fist and hammers the creature in the face. Through closed eyes, the creature hears the wail of a siren and the squawk of a police car, police radio. Its head pulsates with sick waves of pain that move in and out like an ocean tide. Streams of sweet, salt, salty stickiness leak into its mouth. It cries out as its nose bumps against a hard surface. Shut up, you! A deep male voice rings out. The creature pries open one eye and finds itself slumped on the back seat of a squat car, its hands cuffed behind its back with ever-tightening metal restraints that dig into its wrists. It groans as it sits up and looks out the window at the palm-lined streets speeding past the window. A mustachioed black police officer in the passenger seat whips around and glowers at the creature through the grate. I said, shut the f*** up! The squad car jerks to a stop in front of the Beverly Hills police station, and the mustachioed officer roughly hustles the creature into the hands of a pair of waiting bailiffs. They drag the creature inside and downstairs into the bowels of the building, where they yank off its earring, strip off its gown, and process it into a holding cell in the male section of the jail. That's uh, just a brilliant example of everything that the uh, that's in the novel, and um, obviously references a bit of what we were talking about earlier, which is uh, interesting. Uh, so you've, going to your work in general, you have published now both a short story collection and a longish novel. Has writing the novel changed your preference for one format of the, uh, over the other? You know, do you have a preference? Yeah, I think I, I enjoy working in the uh, long format. Uh, although um, I would say that my method for writing longer format fiction is to try to aspire to have each chapter uh, to be the equivalent of a short story, um, not necessarily standalone, but I like for it to have a beginning, a middle, and an end, as opposed to just you know randomly assigning chapter numbers to one long narrative. Hmm. So on that subject, uh, or related subjects, what is next? So I've got a book that's in uh, editing at the moment. It's called The Savior of Sixth Street, and it's a novel. Um, it's not as long as The Death of Baseball. It's about half the length, actually. And uh, so, yeah, so I'm hoping to shop it around uh, soon and uh, fingers crossed to have it published in... Um, maybe 2021, if I can interest a publisher in it. Uh, obviously, a lot of your characters are dark. Do you think, or or have you even with this new book, uh, have you got any like uh, good characters, do you think, in your future? <laughs> uh, not, that the ba- not that the dark characters are bad. I mean, they're, they're brilliant. It's incredible reading, but just wondering. Uh, I'd say that, um, yeah, I made a conscious effort, actually, in The Savior of Sixth, Sixth Street, to um to lighten it up a bit mm. um I, th- I think there's still I, I i like to write with a certain intensity and and when i write i often am playing some fairly intense 
music in in the background to to inspire me. So I, I, the writing will still be intense, but I think in terms of the characters, the way they'll be viewed, I, I think that they are uh, are actually good people with good intentions that get into some very difficult situations. Um, mm -hmm. And so, so yeah, I'd say so. So uh, in Savior Sixth Street, if I can just briefly just give you a little idea of what it's about. Uh, the Savior Sixth Street is a mixed race um, artist who lives at the edge of downtown LA in a, in a an impoverished uh, environment, but he's a very talented street artist. And he is discovered at an art show by a, uh, a young woman who's a, um, who's an heiress who lives on the west side of Los Angeles, and she's in charge of curating her family's art collection. So she, she identifies him as somebody who she'd like to rescue from this impoverished life that she, the way she sees it, and to bring him to the attention of the art world, the international art world. And he himself, the character, the artist himself, he's actually quite pleased and happy to live in the neighborhood that he does live in. That's where his whole identity is based. And so it's this, uh, struggle between the two of them um, and and the relationship that develops out of that. That is very intriguing. Yep, I know I can see that being absolutely fascinating. Orlando, it's been fantastic having you on the show, and I know I'm very much looking forward to your next book. Um, as your and your work always provides a great great reading experience, which is one that I treasure. Both Jerusalem Ablaze and the, Be and the Death of Baseball are out now from Cloud Lodge Books. Links are in the description. Go and read them. Orlando, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you, Charlie. It's been a great pleasure and I uh, look forward to uh, catching up with you later. Join me on Monday the 25th of November when I will be talking to Naomi Hamill, author of How to Be a Kosovan Bride. The Wormhole Podcast, Episode 2 was recorded on the 22nd of October and published on the 11th of November 2019. Music and production by Charlie Place.